We want to thank those who have made tonight possible, beginning with Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation, which for 16 consecutive years has underwritten and fully funded the Calb Report series. The partnership that produces our series includes the National Press Club Journalism Institute, the George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs, Harvard Shorenstein Center, University of Maryland, University College, the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland, and the Gaylord College of Journalism at the University of Oklahoma. Our new presenting station, and we say this with extra pride tonight, is Maryland Public Television. We thank MPT for its commitment to our series. This is our first program with MPT as our presenting station. I'd like to acknowledge in our audience tonight some of the leaders of our partner organizations, beginning with the president of University of Maryland University College, Javier Meares, whose support has been really critical to our success and is so greatly appreciated. Javier? From the George Washington University, the director of the School of Media and Public Affairs and a mighty fine journalist in his own right, Frank Sesno. <laughs> From the University of Oklahoma, the dean of the Gaylord College of Journalism and Mass Communication, Ed Kelly. In our audience tonight, we have students from several universities and a number of working journalists, and we thank you all for your support. We want to thank our student volunteers this evening, our Calb Report staff, and the broadcast team here at the National Press Club, led by Tina Creek and Scott Graham, and our producers, Lindsay Underwood, Bob Ludwig, Brian Kane, Dick Golden, Gil Klein, Steve Murphy, Kat Bug, and Avi Feinberg. A very special thanks to our senior producer, Heather Date, who is down in the fourth floor control room, and to our director, Shelley Schwartz. Once again, our sincere thanks to Koki and uh, to our moderator, my friend and colleague of the past 25 years, the last person personally hired at CBS News by Edward R. Murrow, Marvin Kalb. <laughs> When we're all done tonight, we have an announcement about our next program. We're going to hold that until the end of the program. And um, so uh, before you leave, uh, we'll be able to tell you about our next program. We hope you enjoy this evening's program. And uh, we will begin, as our, um, as our wonderful floor manager, Lindsay Underwood, says, in less than one minute. So thank you and enjoy the evening. The CALB Report is funded by a grant from the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. From the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., this is the Kalb Report with Marvin Kalb. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club and to another edition of the Kalb Report. I'm Marvin Kalb and our program tonight, a conversation with Koki Roberts about democracy, politics, and the press. It is not Every journalist who's identified as a legend, 
Not every journalist who's been at it for more than 40 years. Not every journalist who's now risen to the lofty level of commentator. No, indeed, but Koki Roberts of NPR and ABC fame has done it all, and it is our pleasure and honor to spend the next hour with Koki. Well, what a treat to be with you, Marvin. Thank you. And by the way, Koki. Mm. How did we get to Koki? Koki. <laughs> well, my name is Mary Martha Corrine Morrison Claiborne Box Roberts. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> it's your basic Southern Catholic name. And um, my brother, when I came home from the hospital, uh, he was three and I was baby, uh, couldn't pronounce Corrine. So he, he dubbed me Koki. Uh, but half of New Orleans, which is my hometown, is named Corrine. So we all have nicknames, and I got off easy. I mean, I have cousins named Oopie and Poochie and Pookie. And, you know, <laughs> so Koki was better than most. So Koki, it shall be. Now, you come out of a distinctly political family. Your father, Hal Boggs, was for a time the House Majority Leader. Lindy Boggs, whom I remember very well, your mother, who served for nine terms in the House. You could have gone into politics, I imagine, but at a certain point you married a guy named Steve Roberts right. and he was a reporter and you had that pull in one way or the other, be a journalist, be a politician. If you look back upon it now, did you make the right call? Well, you know, it's, it's like anything else. You, you know, you, I've been married for 52 years um, and I can't imagine anything else. <laughs> uh, so it is, it's like people say to me, what was it like to grow up in a political family? How do I know? You know, it's the way one grew up. So I don't know the difference. Um, certainly, uh, it's been a wonderful life. I've been able to do great stories. I've met fabulous people. I've uh, had that incredible privilege of having a front seat to history. Um, and I've certainly enjoyed uh, writing the books that I write. Uh, or I enjoy them when they're done. And um, uh, so I, I, I've loved the I've had a very, very wonderful life. On the other hand, uh, I do admire greatly the people in the arena, the people who get in there and do it. And, mm -hmm. um, and being on the outside kind of watching is not in my nature. <laughs> but um, Steve and I met when we were 18 and 19. Uh, he was always going to be a journalist. He wanted to be a journalist from the time he was like 10 years old. And it would have been very hard on him if I had gone into politics. So I... What do you mean by that, hard Well, on because him? What, was, what would he do? I mean, he was... He'd cover of, you. <laughs> well, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard enough having my mother there, although it was wonderful. But uh, she was terribly discreet, though. It was just, she was disgustingly discreet. <laughs> but, uh, but it was nice just having her there. Um, but the, um, the fact is that uh, it, would have, it would have been hard, but I do greatly admire those who do it. And I'm the only member of my original nuclear family who didn't run for Congress. Now, mm. they didn't win. Um, my mother's the only person who never lost an election. But, um, but my brother and sister both ran, and my sister was a politician in New Jersey. And it's very important work, public service. And, um, and to be a good public servant, as all of my family members were, is something incredibly admirable. But you've been at this now of journalism for, as I said, more than 40 years, <laughs> 50. Um, but all things change. And I'm wondering, as you look back on a good, long, distinguished career, what, in your judgment, about journalism has changed? Oh. And is it for the better? Well, so much has changed, as you well know. No, but tell us but about when it. We were, when you and I were first doing television, it was all on film. I mean, yes. and you, you would have to get, come in, I mean, you basically had to get it done before noon because you had to come in and change it from positive film to negative, I mean, negative film to f positive film and sit there in front of a little moviola <laughs> looking at the little, the little tiny pictures and then cutting it with a razor blade and splicing it together with scotch tape. Um, and that was television. And, uh, and if you were abroad, as you certainly were much longer than I, um, the, uh, 
uh, fact is, is that you had to, I mean, there was a satellite in London and there was one in Tel Aviv. And you had to get it to, you had to physically get it to that satellite mm -hmm. on an airplane. And it was film. We're still talking about film. So, you know, the world has changed dramatically. Now you can show up in uh, Mozambique for the cyclone and with a, a satellite telephone and stick it up in the air and be live on the air. I mean, it's just remarkable. But all of this dramatic technological change, has it been good? Some is good and some is bad, like no, anything you're else. Now. It, no, I'm not ducking. I mean, it's reality. I mean, it's, it's wonderful to be able to know what's going on anywhere in the world at any time. What's not good is that it comes to you unfiltered. So there's no, um, there's no editor. And there's nobody who's saying, wait a minute, hold on. Mm -hmm. is, is that something that um, you know, is correct? Is it true? Mm -hmm. Uh, now, you're looking at live coverage, so you have the sense of it being true. But, you know, we just had that example here on the mall with that kid, uh, with the, you know, with, with the MAGA hat. Yes. And every piece of video off a phone was different from the other one. Yes. And so you can't just say, oh, it's live on the air and therefore it must be correct. There is a role for editors. And, uh, and we that, don't have enough of them. We don't have enough of them. But you have done the beat kind of reporting, and you are now doing the commentating kind of reporting. Which of the two, by the way, do you like more? Oh, well, I liked beat when I was young and healthy. I mean, okay. you know. <laughs> but um, it's hard work. You know, you work very long hours. Right. And, um, and at NPR, they started um, Morning Edition while I was there. And, and so you just, you know, I kept saying, we should be some productivity report, you know. We, we're, we're filing twice as much as we ever have before and nobody's paying us anymore. Um, but so it's, you know, it was a lot of work and of course now it's constant. It's the 24-7 um, news cycle and um, that also has its advantages and disadvantages. I think its hugest disadvantage, by the way, is that it's very hard to report. Uh, you are so, you're filing so much of the time that it's very hard to do the actual reporting. Mm -hmm. And it becomes derivative. And they've hired you presumably because you're a good reporter. And you should be the person down there talking to people and doing the reporting and filing when you've got the story instead of filing, 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 filing. Spell filing. out this derivative idea. You know, you're, you're, taking other people's, you're taking other people's work because that's what you've got available to you if you have to file constantly. You can't both report constantly and file constantly. It's physically impossible. We're so absorbed now with politics, and, and I was thinking the other day in preparing this program about Dave Broder, the great political reporter for the Washington Post. I remember him telling me and a lot of other people that really good political reporting, you've got to use that a lot of shoes, and you've got to knock on a lot of doors. True. And I'm also told by political reporters today that they're not doing as much of that at all. Are the people getting enough of good, solid political reporting today? Well, I think overall, yes. Um, uh, there are lots of people out on the road doing these things. And certainly at NPR, you see it all the time. But, um, but it's... Uh, there's a, a constant effort to do it. Does it show up in the uh, signature broadcast of the networks? Not necessarily. Does it show up on the websites? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are a lot of good reporters out there doing it. It's a question of the minutes in the broadcast and how much is... Where do you find the really good political reporters today? Where do you find their work? Oh, are they everywhere? I mean, Where? But the, well, I mean, I keep coming back to NPR, but you know, there's a reason. Um, but um, but I, you know, there are good political reporters at our mainstream newspapers. There are good re political reporters on all kinds of websites. Um, I mean, the the fact is, is that we have more information available to us than ever before in human history. The real question is sorting through it and understanding what's legitimate information and what's not. So we're not fake news. We're not there's losing. no such thing. Well, can I just say there's no such thing as fake news? There's news. <laughs> and? There's, I mean, there's news and then there's something else. 
but that's not news. When, when President Trump used the expression enemy of the people to describe the American press, I know what my reaction right. was, but I'm kind of curious. The first time you heard it, what were the things running through your mind? Well, of course, I'm old enough that my first reaction was it's Stalinistic. Um, those, that's the first person I remember saying those words. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, that's what went through my mind. Uh, it's, it was an attack on the press in a, in a way that is very frightening from a perspective of a free society. Spill that out for me. Well, I mean, look, you know, you and I write books, right? I write history books. The uh, fact that the founders uh, actually passed the First Amendment is remarkable to me because, you know, anybody who thinks that we're a bunch of scallywags should meet the press of the 18th century, right? I mean, they totally made it up. And, um, and they, were, they were bought and sold. And um, uh, at one point, uh, the Republican, the Democratic Republican press wrote that John Adams and his running mate, Charles Pinckney, uh, that Pinckney had brought home from the court of St. James four women, two for him and two for Adams. Um, <laughs> Adams says, if it's true, I got cheated. Uh, but, um, and the Federalist press said that um, jo Thomas Jefferson was was pimping, that was the word, uh, Dolly Madison and her sisters in exchange for votes. So it's not like, you know, things have just gotten rough. Uh, <laughs> but um, it was still, that was the way the press was when the First Amendment was passed and ratified. And um, there was a very strong sense that remained true even when members of the administrations of the past wanted to take members of the press out and shoot them. Um, that, that this was absolutely essential to a free society. Um, uh, now, Jefferson famously said, if I had to choose, you know, then he changed his mind, but you know, that was <laughs> typical of Jefferson. That was after, then, he left. Right? <laughs> after he left. Right, after he left. But so uh, to, to have, I mean, our presidents have had fights with the press forever. Mm -hmm. Abigail Adams talked about the scurrility of the press, a word we must bring back. Um, and. Um, the Alien and Sedition Acts, all of that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but in the end, they have either given in or they have come to understand the value. And, uh, they being the president. Right. And, uh, and now we're in a position where that's really not the case. So we cannot count on history being the guide now for what will happen next. No, of course not. I mean, you can hope, and you can always hope that American institutions are strong enough, which is my fundamental belief, but that's because I'm a Pollyanna. But the, um, but I, you know, you, you have to, what you can't do is just say, oh, it's all going to be okay. You have to be in a position to say, we have to defend our institutions. And for those of us in the press, and the press club has really been rising to this occasion beautifully, um, is to say, we, we can't just let this pass. We can't just say, oh, okay, presidents have always hated us. We are not the enemy of the people, and we have to make that very, very clear. But there are, okay, there are still, according to the figures I have in my mind anyway, 32% of the American people, Democrats and Republicans, who agree with the president. Sure. That the enemy of the people is the press. 32%, that's one in three Americans who actually believe that. Well, pretty much 32% of the people agree with the president on everything. And no, and I'm not saying that facetiously. That's the number. Um, and um, he, he has that core support, regardless mm -hmm. of what happens. Mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, But people don't like the press. We were never meant to be liked. Um, you know, that was not, our job is not to be liked, mm -hmm. uh, but, we, but we have an important job to do. I do think that what this situation uh, creates is something quite useful, which is that we have to be absolutely on our toes. Mm -hmm. um, that, you, you know, you basically can't get anything wrong. 
And that's good. That's a good thing. It's hard, but it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. I can't say your tie had broad stripes. Actually, the gold ones are, but the blue ones aren't. So I'd have to say, broad gold stripes, narrow blue ones. Just stick to, I mean, be Do as- Do you like it? I like it, it's a very nice tie. <laughs> My high school colors were blue and gold. But, um, but I was on the gold team, so I like the big gold. But, the, um, but the, the truth is, we have to be very, very careful. And that's good. Okay, on the issue of the coverage of the Mueller report, for example, you know very well, and it may come back to what you said a moment ago about the 32%, but a significant body of American opinion believes that the press botched that coverage completely. And then there's a good, bit, good number of people who feel they did a reasonably good job. I'm one of those. Um, I think that the American people would not know 90% of what they know about the Mueller report and what it talks about uh, President Trump, had it not been for the press. But the, the problem is there's the press and the press and the press and the press, right? All right, so, so what are we talking about? So if you're talking about people on cable television screaming and yelling, and, uh, and people who, you know, I mean, frankly, if you look at, you know, the right wing and left wing cable television, I don't think, I mean, I frankly don't watch them, uh, but um, from what I hear, uh, <laughs> they... You know, there was a lot of, of hype, and, um, th- but that's not the mainstream press. It's just out there doing the job. But I am troubled these days in any definition of the mainstream press. I mean, we can end up by saying it's CBS, NBC, ABC, the New York Times, Washington Post, that's mainstream press, and everything else isn't? No. I mean, No, to- lots of local newspapers are. Uh, lots of local... No, but what about the television end of it, which appears to get some of the negative uh, on any judgment of the press, people will talk, as you did, about cable television. Cable television is a very important means of communication for the American people. They're picking up a great deal of information that they wouldn't have otherwise. I agree. It's fine if you're reporting the news, but a huge amount of it is people opining, and endlessly, and all on one side or the other. So it becomes this incredible echo chamber where no other point of view is put out. I mean, honestly, here's when I see it. When I go to get my nails done, right? That's when I see cable television. It's on in the nail salon. I mean, I'd prefer soap operas. And um, the, and I, I'm gobsmacked by it. I mean, it's just people yelling and screaming. And um, it's, not, it's not illuminating. But, Koki, I don't think, forgive me, but I don't think <laughs> it's fair to equate the right and the left. Um, the right is almost, I'm talking now about Fox News. Fox Cable News is almost, in what it is that it says, an arm of the White House. The MSNBC equivalent on the, quote, left, does make an effort to try to find out what's going on, and they bring well, in people who NBC do. NBC News does. But, NBC but, News does. But the, but the talk shows are an awful No, no, lot. I'm aware that the anchors <laughs> for the talk show on both Fox and MSNBC do have very strong points of view, and they express them. And I've got no problem with that. We know what they are. But when you say, has the press covered this well, who are we talking about? Are we talking about everybody? Because if you're talking about everybody, the answer is, you know, a lot of people didn't. No, but this is exactly what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> the difficulty of defining the press, what it is that the press does, where do the American people get information that they can find that is reliable? There was a time in both our lives when we were involved in passing on information not to score any political point, but genuinely to pass on as solid information as we could produce. Um, I sense that the American people don't expect that of us anymore. And And they didn't in the olden days either. Uh, You know, uh, I'm not just in the 18th century. I mean, think about early 20th century newspapers. You knew what somebody's political views were when you sat on the subway and saw what newspaper they were reading. 
You know, but there were a lot of newspapers. There were a lot of newspapers, but they were very opinionated. And, um, you know, so we, we've gone through different periods. And also, you know, Marvin, I have to say, as a woman, uh, in that period that you're talking about, yes, we did, you know, um, just try to tell the story. But the people telling the story were almost entirely 99.9%, percent .9 white males. And they were telling the story from their perspective. And it might not have been politically biased in their views, but it, was, it carried a bias. It carried the bias of the privilege of, of your existence. And, um, and the kinds of stories that were of interest to uh, minorities and to women uh, were not covered. So, you know, the good old days were not all that good for everybody. No, fair enough, fair enough. But what about the people who were not the anchors then? Uh, the women, minorities? Well, hardly any of them were, were on the air or in the papers. I mean, no, 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 what I'm getting, <laughs> when I'm trying to understand what do you think that the white male delivering that news was giving them slanted news? No, they were just giving them the news that interested them. Look, in every newsroom... But, what you, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Interested them? They were it, journalists. They the, weren't interested in what happened. But, but Marvin, in every newsroom, you know very well, you've, you've got stories and stories and stories. So the lead story is usually as plain as the nose on your face on most days. Not every day, but most days. But then there are all those other stories. And those other stories are stories that someone brings to the editorial meeting. And when they bring that story to the editorial meeting, that story comes from you know, something they're experience. interested in. Yeah. And you know, I always say it should be you know, people who believe in rocks and people who believe in rock and roll. I mean, it should be people with all kinds of different interests, of all kinds of backgrounds, of all different ages. Uh, and, uh, and that's when you get a yeasty, good, full report uh, that, that really represents America. I totally agree with you. Moving on. In <laughs> politics, in politics, um, I always get asked this question about foreign affairs. So I'm going to ask you a question about <laughs> politics. Is there a story that when you look back upon this many years, you look back and you say, wow, that was a humdinger. I love that one. Which one was it? No, you know, I'm terrible at this. Um, and partly because they're all so different from each other, you know. Um, uh, I mean, there's some that are just fascinating, and often those are voter stories, you know, um, just going out and uh, I'll tell you one that's just, it's, I, I don't see it as a humdinger, but it was very enlightening. It was in Belzona, Mississippi, uh, at the Rotary Club. Now, in those years, I was always the only female at the Rotary Club other than the piano player. <laughs> and um, and these were farm equipment salesmen, um, um, insurance guys. Some of them were actual farmers, and then dentist lawyers, etc. And this was 1982, and Reagan was president. And they were saying, you know, we really don't like all this spending on defense. And I'm saying, what? You're in Belzona, Mississippi. You're supposed to love this spending on defense. Um, and they said, no, we run businesses. Nobody can take that much money into a business that fast and have it run well. And I thought, well, this is interesting. This is new information. Mm -hmm. And you know, you get, you just have moments like that where you just uh, get something that's completely away from the uh, the wisdom of the day. What again? And, uh, well, I didn't cover Watergate. Oh. Uh, I was in Greece, um, and that was a great story. Um, that was the fall of the junta and the return of democracy and the, um, the referendum on the monarchy, and yeah, it was a great story. Uh, Cy my, the, um, Steve was, had gone to Cyprus uh, to, uh, because it was falling apart, and um, I was stringing for CBS, and... I get a call in the middle of the night, and uh, CBS says, um, the Turks have just invaded Cyprus. And I said, oh my god, Steve's there. 
And they thought it was a competitive statement. They said, <laughs> they said well, we've got a man there, too. And I said, not the point. <laughs> but um, so, you know, that was, that was heady stuff um, and very dramatic. But, you know, and, and covering papal elections, honest to God, there's nothing like covering a papal election. Nobody has a clue. I mean, it, we are so ignorant when you're covering a papal election, you can't imagine, right? And the, they are just hysterical. The last one uh, for Francis. So uh, before that, ABC had been able to get this wonderful balcony of Cardinal Baum, but then he died. And um, so nobody else was willing to do this. And we had this set that was like an erector set, it really was. It was this terrifying thing on top of the Santo Spiritu Hospital. <laughs> and the Santo Spiritu Hospital was 16th century, and it's still a hospital. I mean, <laughs> you really hope the Santo Spiritu shows up. And, um, <laughs> and so we <coughs> climb up you know, to this terrifying <clears throat> erector set thing that's blowing around. It's freezing cold, it's pouring rain, and all of the Vaticanistas, who are men who pretend that they know what they're talking about, and of course they don't, uh, have said there's no way there's going to be an election today. And so you're sitting up there for hours staring at a chimney. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's ridiculous, right? Um, and at one point, a seagull took up residence on the chimney and immediately got a hashtag, Sistine Seagull. And, um, but you knew there was no heat because there was a seagull up there. And, um, and uh, finally, smoke comes. And at first, you can't tell what color it is. And then it's white. And oh my god, there's a broadcast to do. You know? So everybody sits up and buttons up. And you know, we have not a clue what we are talking about. Right? <laughs> I mean, you know, and it's a full hour between the time the camera lingo, whatever his name is, comes out and says, Habemus Popham, or, or the, no, the smoke comes up, and then he comes. So we're just making it up, you know. What does it mean that it happened on Wednesday and not on Thursday, you know, <laughs> and all that. And, um, and finally, he comes out, and I had, of course, done my good girl homework, so I knew all the names and everything about all the papabile, and, um, and then they say Bergoglio. Who the heck is Bergoglio, right? <laughs> and so I'm frantically going through my papers and find him. And then I say, live on the air, this very sophisticated line, hey, wait, everybody, this is a big deal. <laughs> He's a Jesuit. And then I get this look of, what, huh, <laughs> Jesuit? You know. So then I have to explain all that. Oh, my goodness, it was quite something. But, so, but you know, but that was a good example of what I was starting to talk about earlier, because as we were sitting up there being miserable in the rain and, and wind, hundreds of thousands of people came into St. Peter's Square. Sure. And with umbrellas and all of that. And I thought, they're crazy. These people are crazy. It's freezing cold, and they're looking at a chimney. And then I thought to myself, you jerk. You know, you get to do this all the time. Mm -hmm. You are so privileged to have witnessed history over Absolutely. and over and Absolutely. over again. And these people are having their moment of witnessing history. And what, a, what an incredible joy and honor, frankly, it Absolutely. is for us as journalists to be able to do that. Oh, Koki, I want to take a minute now just to uh, tell our radio and television audiences to identify us. This is the Kalb Report. I'm Marvin Kalb, and I'm here talking with Koki Roberts. And I want to return for a moment now to your parents and ask you to, to imagine, ask, asking you to imagine that you're sitting around with them, and they are now with us. And they witness American politics as it is being unfurled before us. What do you think they're thinking about this process now described as broken, rigged, and, and a few other words. They wouldn't like it. Um, uh, they would find it very distasteful. They had very good friends uh, who were on the other side of the aisle. Uh, when my father's plane disappeared, Jerry Ford was there constantly. Uh, Mac Mathias was at our house every night, the Republican senator from Maryland. Um, and, uh, it was it was a different time, though, Marvin. And 
you know, we talk about a different time in journalism, it was a different time in politics. And, and part of it, uh, again, as somebody who's been writing history books for, you know, a good while, 20 years now, um, the, the time that my father and Jerry Ford came to Congress, I have come to believe was aberrational. Um, it was post-World War II. There were these two enormous classes of veterans. Uh, the big Republican class of 1946, the big Democratic class of 1948. They ran very self-consciously as veterans. They ran as the men who went, not the men who sent. And it was men. And they had literally, literally been in foxholes together. Mm -hmm. And so they did not see each other as the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not saying it was this nirvana, yeah, yeah. but you know, <clears throat> McCarthy existed during this period, all of that. But they Kennedy and Nixon, for example, were could, quite good friends, right, got along. Right. And, um, the, and you know, Tip O'Neill and Bob Michael, right. all of that. Right. Um, the uh, fact is that that period lasted through the Cold War for a good while. And so you had, I mean, our last World War II veteran in Congress was John Dingell, who left, left, left yes. in the last Congress. So um, you had this sense that the enemy was not the guy across the aisle, it was the dictator across the sea. And so those were the years when a tremendous amount got done. I mean, you think about it, you know, mm -hmm. these are the, this is the Marshall Plan, this is the whole rebuilding of Europe, this is NATO, this is, you know, then, the, then it becomes the great society. I mean, just, you know. So what are you saying, that now, so is, now is, is the been, norm? And I'm afraid it's more like the norm. Really? That our politics have been very divisive and um, hostile. I mean, honestly, I, you know, I, my most recent book was a Civil War book. <laughs> That was bad. And, um, and um, the period before the Civil War, everybody was armed. Everybody was armed. They all went to Congress with guns. Um, and, um, and they shot each other. Uh, you know, Burr Hamilton was just the most famous duel, but they dueled all the time. Bladensburg had a dueling ground, and the term of art was you'd call someone out in the halls of the house and bring mm -hmm. them out to Bladensburg and kill them. And um, so, you know, we're not, metal detectors have helped, but, um, <laughs> but um, so we've had bad periods. This period is worse than most of our periods. Why? Um, because this sense of polarization is so high, and the sense that we're not all in it together is higher than it's been. What's the president's responsibility for this? Well, he, the, the, it happened long before the president. Um, it's been happening for a good while. Uh, but he has not um, made it easier. What is his responsibility for this? Well, I think, I think a president does have a responsibility to try to bring people together. Uh, but, you know, our most recent... Has he done that? No, but neither... Our, our most recent presidents, even before him, attempted it and couldn't succeed. Um, George W. Bush and Barack Obama both ran on trying to bring a new tone to Washington, a civility to Washington, all of that, and they couldn't succeed. Bush was amazed by it. He had done it in Texas, and um, he didn't realize that the Democratic Party he was dealing with in Washington was not the Democratic Party he was dealing with in Texas. And of course, you had the 2000 election, where Democrats thought he was an illegitimate president. And, um, and then Obama tried it and um, also failed. It's, it's very hard in today's America to bring people together. This president is, is pushing people farther, further apart, in my view, but he didn't start it. I don't think I'm asking you about who started it. <laughs> I'm asking you about the responsibility that you would place. I would like him to try to make people come together, okay? That's not what he's going to do. So um, You don't see him next year doing it? No. So how do you see next year? 2020. Oh. <laughs> well, we're going to have, I mean, we're going to have 20, 30, 50 <laughs> Democratic candidates. <laughs> and, and the first debates are June of this year. I mean, who's ever heard of that? Um, although I have to tell you, actually, um, uh, so when James Monroe 
I will just do a tiny bit of history here. So, so everybody knew he was the last founder to be president, right? And they kind of just gave it to him. All right, fine, Monroe, you're it. And uh, by that time, the Federalist Party had disappeared. Uh, but they really didn't want him to do anything. And, um, and they certainly didn't want him to stick around. And so, you know, he's elected in 1820. And the election um, of 1824, he was elected in 1816 and then 20. But so for the election of 1824, they start nominating people in 1818 for 24. So, you know, it has been worse. Um, but um, but uh, I, the notion of debates in June of, of 2019 for 2020 is, is quite intriguing. Um, 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 people have said that occasionally, I have good instincts, and uh -huh. my instinct tells me that you don't want to discuss Trump very much at all. <laughs> Look, I said, and I want to ask this question: well, yeah. Is Trumpism in your mind? Um, does that herald a new form of populism, a new kind of politics in America? No, not at all. No, it it it, it brings back up lots of old kinds of populism in America. I always said he would win. Everybody thought I was crazy. And I kept saying he was gonna win. Um, and there were lots of reasons for that. But um, he, he speaks to, um, I mean, we've all gone through this a lot. He speaks to people who want things to be the way they were. And he, uh, he says that quite explicitly. And you know what we've been living through is basically the equivalent of the Industrial Revolution. And you think about the Industrial Revolution. Everybody was forced into a completely new life. You lived on the farm. Your value was what you produced. Um, and that was particularly true for women who did all the home manufacture. And all of a sudden, you're thrust off the farm, you're into a city, you're into a completely different place, you're paid by the hour, not by what you produce, paid very little by the hour. You're often forced to go across the world to you know, Rhode Island, whatever, and, um, and it is, you know, your entire world is completely turned upside down. That's what we've been living through in this country. Uh, and it has nothing to do with globalization and all that. It has to do with technology. And so, you know, I remember in the middle of the South Carolina primary in 2016, um, there was an announcement that Marriott was going to make all of the towels for every hotel in America in America. I'm in Textiles Central, right? Everybody's so excited. You open a textile mill today, it's gorgeous. It whirs, it's quiet, it's clean, it's beautiful. It hires 50 people. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's technology. And the people who are running those machines have to have an education. And that's true of truck drivers. They're running computers where they have to have an education. They don't have to have an, a BA from, from the University of Maryland University College, but they need to have they need to have training. They need to have education. And people who have spent their lives having very good lives, working on an assembly line where they had a house and a boat, and they expected their kids to go into the same line of work, feel unmoored. And I totally get it. And you combine that with the fact that there are all the cultural differences in society and the demographic differences in society, and people don't recognize their America. And that's what Donald Trump has been speaking to. Now, it's a false promise because you can't recreate the past, but it's very appealing to people who did very well then and don't feel that they're doing well now. Okay. Um, you made um, a large point earlier in our talk about men dominating the news environment. In recent years, there has been a lot of talk about the mistreatment of women in newsrooms. Um, that's a very, very serious issue. And it's a good thing that it is now being discussed, and there are steps being taken to try to correct that whole thing. 
What is your impression right now of the position of women within the news business? Are they being treated properly? Are they being respected as they should be? Well, again, it depends on where you are, but is it, is it day and night different from when I went into the news business? Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, at that point, you had men saying to you, we don't hire women to do that with their hands on your knee. And um, actually, actually, I, I actually, with a member of the Senate one day, one night, um, was sitting at a head table, and his hand was on my knee. And I his picked, hand? Well, yes, his hand was on my knee. And Whose I picked, hand? I'm not going to say. I, <laughs> I picked it up put it on the table and said, I think this belongs to you. Um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but I mean, it was so blatant, you know, uh, and, and the discrimination was so blatant. Uh, so honestly, we, we cared less about the harassment than we did about the discrimination. Um, you know, they, give us the job and we'll, we'll escape you. And um, I mean, my colleague Linda Wertheimer talks about when she was an intern for a senator where he was chasing her around the desk, but he was so slow that, <laughs> that she was having to kind of work her way around it, you know. But so, I mean, it's, I think it's wonderful that young women feel the power to say, don't do this. It's inappropriate. Stop. And, and, and for men to be called out on it. Um, that's great. It's very different from when I was growing up. Did you yourself ever, did you ever feel mistreated? Oh, sure, all the time. I mean, that was the way it was. You know, uh, I graduated from college in 1964. Um, I'm dating myself there, but it's all public record. Um, the, um, and uh, the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 was passed in July. Uh, some of you remember before that, the help wanted ads were white, colored, male, female. That was the way it was. Mm. And the only reason women were included <laughs> in the Civil Rights Bill was because two brave women, a Democratic Congresswoman, Martha Griffiths, and a Republican Senator, Margaret uh, Chase Smith, uh, put it in in the employment section. You know, it's so interesting. I talk to young women about this all the time. They all know what Title IX is. They all know, they don't know it's Title IX of the Education Bill of 1972, but they know it's Title IX. And they know that the sports, that they're able to play sports the way they are because of Title IX. They really know it. <coughs> Nobody knows what Title VII of the Civil Rights Bill is. It changed America for minorities and women. And it says, you know, you cannot discriminate in employment on the basis of race, religion, national origin, color. And then Margaret Griffiths put in sex. And the men in Congress thought it was a riot. They brought it up, laughed about it. She said, you know, this shows you why we need it. And, um, and now that we have the wonderful Johnson tapes, that night, um, you know, the, the strategy was to get the bill through the House as cleanly as possible because the Senate was going to be the problem, right? And so Jack Brooks, the longtime Texas congressman who ended up chairman of the Judiciary Committee, calls Johnson uh, to say, we've got the bill through. We've gotten it through. And Johnson <laughs> says, is there anything in there that's a problem? And uh, Brooks says, well, there's something about women, but I think it's fine. And there's something about women, but I think it's fine. That's what changed employment for women in America. <laughs> no, that did it. Cookie, if, if there are probably in the audience here young women who will want to go into journalism now. Do you have specific advice that you would give? To sure, them? go for it. It's fun. It's fabulous. I mean, I've been talking about this incredible honor. Of, of being there when things are happening. Mm -hmm. But it's also fascinating. You have a license to snoop. And um, you know, every day you learn something new. I mean, that's it's why true. you're still doing it. You know, it's true. Uh, every Absolutely. single day you learn something new. I want to switch subjects. On, um, Merle spent a good bit of time thinking about the role of television news in the nurturing and the strengthening of American democracy. 
And I'm wondering if you have an overall sense about whether television news as you know it and as it continues to be presented to the American people, does it strengthen our democracy as you see it or in some ways weaken it? Well, again, there's news and news and news. I mean, that's where oh, we are on. today. No, no, but I'm seriously. I mean, when you were starting out in television news, there was ABC, NBC, and CBS. Actually, there was actually NBC and CBS. <laughs> and then, no, and ABC did come along. <laughs> did, and then it came along, right. But um, so, you know, that was a very different era. And in that era, you can certainly make the case that it strengthened American democracy. And now? Um, well, now it's much more diffuse. And so you have the same uh, same sort of issues going on in television news that you have in the society as a whole. You don't have, what we don't have is any kind of unifying uh, organization of any kind, whether it's the news or whether it's the presidency or whether it's the Congress, and Congress actually means coming together. Um, there's nothing that pulls us all together as one people mm. other than a tragedy um, or the Fourth of July. Um, and um, that's, you know, that's a, a troubling situation. I want to um, quote Murrow on what he said back in 1958, he did a speech in Chicago and talked about the impact of television news on, on our society. And you know this quote. He said, this instrument can teach, it can illuminate, yes, it can even inspire, but it can only do so to the extent that humans are determined to use it <laughs> to those ends. Otherwise, it's simply lights and wires in a box. But then the quote that doesn't often get used, <laughs> There is a great and perhaps decisive battle to be fought against ignorance, intolerance, and indifference. And this weapon of television could be useful. And I'm wondering now, from your experience, do you feel that television is being used by the networks today, now, what we experience day and night, to fight what Morrow called ignorance, intolerance, and I, I think there's an attempt. Um, you know, you're always in the ratings game. And, uh, and, you know, unfortunately, you can't force people to watch what's worthy. Um, you know, we could tie them to a chair and put toothpicks in their eyes and say, watch this hour-long debate, but it's not going to work. Um, and uh, so, but I do think there's an attempt to try to get there. It's, it's, not, um, it's not something as it was in Morrow's time. Uh, we're living in a very different time when people are so distracted by so many things. Um, mm -hmm. And to try to even get them to pay attention for any period of time is very, very difficult. But I do think that attempt is there. That's what those... You know, they're, they're kind of feel-good attempts. Um, the things about, you know, American heroes or making a difference and those things that are in the network <coughs> broadcast um, that are trying to show the best of society. Mm -hmm. And they, are, they include very diverse people. Uh, and so I think that's where the attempt is, is in sort of showing America that there are lo there's a lot of goodness in this society and to celebrate that. But think, it's not sort of hitting people over the head and saying, <laughs> you know, here's what we have to be, here's who we are as a nation and here's who we have to be. It's telling stories. And telling stories is, of course, what we're all about. But of around. course you can tell stories as you hit people over the head. A good story, no seriously, a good story, you write them, I try to write them. If you write a good story, people might be interested right, in what absolutely. you're writing about. Right? Absolutely. So what I'm trying to get at here is perhaps resurrecting something which can't be resurrected. I appreciate that. But I do go back tomorrow often, I fear, because I don't see enough of the spirit that drove a reporter like him today. For example, on an issue like climate change, Murrow would probably say, and he complained about it in 1950, that it was not happening, but it ought to happen. But on climate change today, 
putting aside the politics of it, it is a big issue. There would be nothing horrific if every network would spend two minutes once a week, but regularly hit that story over the head. Bring it to the attention of the American people in a way that they then can do something about it. But at the moment, the only instrument that can do that, to the best of my knowledge, is something like television. People do watch television. And if you could give them something like this, it doesn't have to be on the commercial networks. It can be on some of the others. But as you well. know, I think that people are catching on to that. And, and oh. some of it, well, because of the kinds of stories that are coming out of places like Mozambique right now. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and people saying, we never had storms like this before. Yes. Um, I mean, it sounds silly, but it absolutely captures people. The polar bear on the, yes. on the iceberg, right? I mean, we all know that polar bear. We're worried about that polar bear. And, uh, and I'm very worried about that polar bear. And um, I think that, you know, those, that's a very simple visual story that we all get. And so I do think those stories are being told, but they're not being told as, this is, a, you know, this is something terrible that you have to get out there and do something about. But how do we make the connection? And I think that's also true about gun violence, by the way. Yes. I think those stories are being told. And the stories of uh, the Parkland kids, all of that. I think you know, those stories are being told. Um, as I say, they're not being told as someone delivering a sermon. They're being told by telling the story. And they have created movements. The young lady in Europe. I saw her on the news the other night. She's 16 years old, and she speaks as if she's 40. And she is saying that your generation, the older generation, have, they've, you've failed us. We have to do this now on our own. And we're trying to think of a way of helping her. How do you do that? Well, you organize. Uh, I mean, the only way that you make change is you organize, and you get to the people who vote. Uh, and it really does make a difference. I, I, have, I have a house in South Carolina. A Democrat just won in my district in South Carolina. A white Democrat in South Carolina. I said, you know, they said it couldn't be done. I certainly thought it couldn't be done. The issue was offshore drilling. It was all about offshore drilling. And that's why I won. And you see that in all kinds of places. No, this, don't give up on our democracy. Uh, no, it's we, not a matter of giving up, it's a matter <laughs> of helping it now. Well, I think you help, I mean, it's not our job to organize people, it's our job to tell the stories that they then organize around. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> don't you feel Cody, better we've now? Got about, <laughs> we've got about three minutes left, I'm sorry to say. And I would uh, like to engage in what we'll call a lightning round or rod, whatever. And I'm going to just tick off a name or a thought. And I would like you to give me your top of the head reaction oh, this is to dangerous. it or description. <laughs> Putin. A Putin. So my mother took one look at Putin and said, don't trust that man. <laughs> and I always listen to my mother. <laughs> Rune Arledge. Rune Arledge was a great um, impresario. Uh, he, he was the, for those of you who don't know, he was the president of ABC News and ABC Sports. And he really knew how to put on a program. And he knew how to attract talent and, um, and to, to do a great show. Um, he was not a journalist, but he was somebody who knew how to show off journalists. Twitter. Twitter is just, you know, the bane of the existence of the world. <laughs> Senator McConnell. Senator McConnell is up for re-election. <laughs> <laughs> Millennials. Millennials, really, we need to be patient with. Uh, honestly, it's so funny. You know, I don't work on Saturday. What do you mean you don't work on Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> Secretary Pompeo. Oh, goodness. Um, I'm hoping that he was helpful in getting the president to walk away from the North Koreans. That's and the best I can say. <laughs> <laughs> 2020, 
I asked you that before. 2020 is going to be fascinating, and I think that um, the president has a very good shot at re-election. Is his name Donald Trump? Yeah, that's his name. Is and that he's the, the guy? President. That's that the, the one guy. you were talking about? Yeah. New the York Yankees. The Democrats could really blow it. Um, the New York Yankees my husband adores, and they are the other woman in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Are they going to win the pennant? I doubt it. They always just pay all these people a fortune, and then they don't win. What about Steve Roberts? Oh, well, you know, we've only been married 52 years. Um, <laughs> the love of my life. Okay, I want you to know that I could happily continue this conversation. <laughs> but I think I've run out of time. And um, I would like first to thank our wonderful right. audience here thank at the National Press much. Club and elsewhere in this vastly interconnected world that we all inhabit. But most important to me, I just really want to thank you. Well, thank for you, For taking Marvin. the time to be with us and um, for sharing your thoughts and for leveling with us in almost all areas. <laughs> and to continue to Trying to, be, to stay out of trouble. <laughs> and to continue to be a model, really, in my judgment and the judgment of so many others well, of Marvin, good, you have been, solid, responsible journalism. Well, that's kind of you, but you have been the beacon that we've all followed for no, many, many so. years. So. Anyway, that's it for now. I'm Marvin Calvin. As Ed Morrow used to say many years ago, good night and good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have a last question? Thank you. Thank you. OK, we're now at that point where you can ask questions, and maybe you'll have better luck. <laughs> uh, and there are microphones on both sides here. And when you get up to ask a question, I invite you to do so. Please ask a question. Don't make a speech. And tell us your name and sort of an association of some sort, please. I'm just holding the mic. <laughs> oh. Well, yeah. Thank you, though. <laughs> you want to ask a question? I'm going to leave it up to the audience. Okay. You want to ask a question? I do, Marvin. Thank Please. you for a wonderful program tonight. Lincoln Smith, member of the National Press Club, and for Koki uh, to this discussion tonight, this wonderful discussion. Do you think millennials, those now in their 20s, when they lead our nation someday in the future, I don't know what it's going to be, that they will indeed bring us to that sense that we are all in this together that you discussed, or perhaps not? Uh, so, you know, we joke about millennials. I have my great niece, Charlotte, here, who's in that generation, and she's fabulous. Uh, so I, they're not all lazy. Uh, but um, the, um, the truth is that they have grown up in a very diverse world. And uh, their sense of prejudice, by and large, I mean, you know, you make these statements, and obviously they're true one place and not another. But by and large, um, they really don't get a lot of the prejudices of their forebears. Um, they've, they've grown up in a, a world of all kinds of different people, uh, not just by race and ethnicity, but also by um, gender, um, fluidity, and all of that. And um, so I think they're a much more tolerant um, group of people, and, uh, and that that will have the effect of being uh, more unifying. You know? uh, just uh, driving through the city this afternoon, I saw a group of kids being led by a teacher through a part of the city that is both white and black. And it was a very multicolored right. group of kids. And it was so wonderful to see well, that. Particularly when they're the babies, because they're so adorable. You know, they're holding onto those ropes. And, <laughs> and, and you know, there's this little UN of babies walking through. And it's just adorable. Please, question. I'm Charles Pico. I'm a journalist. I just want to know, Koki, what stories do you think aren't getting as much attention as they should, that you'd like to see aired? or written about? Well, I mean, you know, any given night, I will sit there and say, what about? You know, um, but uh, I do think that the, I mean, I, I do think things like climate change are getting attention, uh, gun violence, but you don't get stories. Uh, you, you're right now in the Me Too moment getting stories about harassment. You don't get stories about discrimination. Um, 
And that's true about racial discrimination as well as, as sexual discrimination. Um, you know, there's, there's, we're about to celebrate the centennial of, of women's suffrage. Um, you know, this should be a moment to be talking about pay equity and equal rights and all of that. And we're not doing that. Um, but I'm sure there are tons of stories that aren't getting covered. That's why I keep saying newsrooms have to be as in just incredibly diverse because people bring to the table stories that they're interested in that I wouldn't even know about that need to be covered. Mm -hmm. no. Yes, please. Hi, um, my name is Jason Pico. I'm wondering about your thoughts about uh, doing away with the Electoral College. Oh, I'm yeah. totally against it. Uh, I have strong views on this subject. Uh, when my Share them. <laughs> <laughs> when my father came to Congress in 1941 at age 26, um, he actually immediately put in a constitutional amendment to abolish the Electoral College. He was wrong. And, um, and in fact, when they, the House did pass it in 68, and he was floor manager. But um, the reason I feel strongly against it is because without it, what we would have is a national election. So it would be all money. It would just be about money. And um, people, it's not just small states who would not have a say, but it would be um, minority groups who would not have a say. So, you know, the Jewish vote in America is about 1% of the vote, but it's a very important vote in Florida. It's a very important vote in New Jersey. Um, the black vote in America is about 10% of the vote, but it's about 30% of the vote in, in Georgia. Um, you know, the Hispanic vote in America is about 12% of the vote. Well, it's working its way up to 30% you know, of the vote in Colorado. Um, so what you have <coughs> is the ability of groups uh, to have much more of a voice and much more say uh, as minorities than they would have uh, in just a nationwide election. And the complaint that I hear from people is that, you know, um, that you, you don't have a vote. You know, if you live in California, it's going to be blue. If you live in New York, it's going to be blue. If you live in Texas, it's going to be red. That's not true. It's true right now, but it won't always be true. I mean, I, I covered in 1980 Texas moving from blue to red. Um, you know, it's states change. New Jersey used to be red, then purple, then blue. You know, states change. Demography changes politics. And uh, I think that um, our various minority groups should have the opportunity to have a louder voice than they would in just a nationwide election. Um, it's interesting when that, when it did, when the um, amendment did pass in 68, uh, the groups that were against it were the Black Caucus, which was tiny at the time, and, um, and Jewish outside groups. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Christian Zuniakoki. I'm with the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, you said earlier. How much fun! <laughs> it is. You said yeah. earlier that uh, the banana slug, right? Banana slug. Right. That's the mascot. <laughs> you said earlier that we can't make people watch what's worthy. Um, do you think that's why there's an emergence of so-called fake news? I know you don't believe there's such a thing as fake news, just news. But do you think that is also a reason of why? news outlets have sort of lost validity among the people? And no. how do they gain that trust back? No, I don't think that's right. Um, no, I think that you have, you know, people watching all kinds of stuff because it's there. You know, I mean, YouTube. You know, how, much, how much time do you spend watching YouTube? You know, um, net, you know, there's just so much out there to be watching. There's Facebook taking up a huge amount of time. There's Instagram. There's, you know, there's so much distracting you uh, from just doing something that's kind of really serious news. And um, I think that, that's, that 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 is where we are right now. There's just a whole lot coming at you. And you can, you know, you, you have the opportunity to spend your day watching almost anything you want to watch, and it doesn't have to be serious at all. But there's an interesting point that the young man mentioned, that the idea of trust. You lose trust, it's hard to get it back. Well, that's true, but I don't think we ever had much trust. <laughs> and, um, and that gets back to that question of liking the press. I mean, 
<laughs> you know, you were in a golden age with Edward R. Morrow. And it, it gets back to what I was saying about that period in Congress after World War II. You know, when Morrow went to cover World War II, he was wearing a United States military uniform. Yeah. And, and everybody was on the same side. There was not a question. Uh, and uh, censorship was accepted mm -hmm. and was part of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, I, my memory is that something like 1,200 journalists landed on D-Day. A not, lot, I don't know. Not one of them broke the story, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they could be trusted to land at Normandy in the greatest surprise attack of the war. And, um, You're not saying this negatively. No, right? I'm saying it was a different time, and everybody was on the same side. And we didn't, there was not a sense on the part of the press that the government was, was evil. Right, was something that they had to question and, and uh, go after. Yes, please. Hi, uh, Bruce Guthrie. One year from today, the 2020 decennial census will be sent out, uh, possibly with a question on citizenship, right. pushing electronic re um, responses. How do you think that's going to go? Well, the census is always fraught. Um, I mean, I wish that there was some way to make it perfect. Um, and of course, the, the smartest thing to do would just be to, to do what the census does for every other survey, which is uh, to, uh, to do sampling, which is what they do for every one of their other surveys except the decennial census. And they're kind of stuck with 1787 there, uh, with, <laughs> <laughs> which the Constitution says. Um, one year when I was covering the census, you know, because I'm fascinated by demographics in America, and um, I didn't fill it out, so the census person had to come to my house uh, so I could record her. Um, but um, she was a little intimidated. But um, the, um, but uh, I'm, I'm very disturbed by a citizenship question. We have trouble enough getting people to feel that the census is a uh, an honest um, just study of who's in America. But they're incredibly useful. Um, I mean, now so many sensei are online. Uh, that you can go back and learn so much about American history by just looking at the census of 1930, 1920, you know, all of that. They're, they're online up to about 40. And um, so, you know, I, I want them to keep doing it, but I want them to be as unintimidating as possible. And that, sense of, that citizenship question is a real problem. Okay, now we've got a number of people waiting, so I'm going to ask you to give shorter okay, answers. Okay, I'll be quick. Please, next question. I, I, can do, I can do broadcasting. My name is Ben Dieter. I'm a student at Miami of Ohio, and I'm curious, Koki, across your career, how have you seen the differences between radio and television in terms of like which one does like, certain things better? Have you seen those differences personified, and then how have you seen those two mediums like evolve into this new digital he era? Wants a short <laughs> <laughs> you want a short answer? No, no, I'd like you to do it in 30 seconds. <laughs> so uh, the, the real answer is the media are different. I mean, there's a reason I report for print, radio, and television. They're all different, and they all tell stories differently. And, um, and uh, it's great to write something complicated in print, where people can go back and reread it. It's fabulous to tell a television story when you have great pictures and people can just look at those and get it. Uh, and if you can write to those pictures, better yet. But, you know, if they can tell the story, wonderful. And radio, you hear the voices, the intimacy, the accents. The, it's, it's just a fabulous medium. And the intimacy of being in the car with somebody who's listening to you or the shower, as some people tell me, um, um, you know, is, is very special. So they all, are, they all have their strengths and they all have their weaknesses. Um, and there's sometimes when you do a story where um, it just works like crazy on the radio and it just is a bomb on television and vice versa. And so it, it really depends on the story. That was beautifully like told. <laughs> that was beautifully told. Yes. Uh, Andrew Craig from the Justice Integrity Project. Oh. You've had a long uh, and distinguished career, of course, but inevitably, 
there are sometimes a story that you fought for that ran against management's view of it. Has there ever been such a situation? No, you know, once I didn't even know this. Uh, uh, the only time that I know of that management got involved in a story that I was doing, and I didn't know it till after it was over, um, was a story about election day um, reporting. And um, uh, we had a rule at ABC that you don't call an election until after the polls close in that state, right? Um, so I was doing something about, oh, I know, I was doing a story that said it actually makes absolutely no difference when you call an election, which is what the data shows. Uh, and, and everybody got all bent out of shape. And it turns out that because they were kind of negotiating with the Congress about it, and you know, I didn't know that. And, um, they, and I didn't care. I mean, I was just going with the story. But, um, and nobody likes that story, by the way. Nobody likes the fact that the data shows that it doesn't matter when you report the results. Um, mm -hmm. And the, what they always go back to is, oh, now I'm going on to So that's the one. <laughs> Your turn. Thank you, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Ben Crawley. I'm from uh, Roger Williams University. I'm a journalism student. Uh, couldn't throughout, hear my, throughout my career there, uh, I, could, I couldn't hear what you said. But oh, I'm Ben Crawley. I'm from Roger Williams University. Oh, great. Um, great. We saw each other. Earlier. Yeah. Um, I was always told growing up that local newspapers and to an extent radio is a dying uh, industry. Um, how do you think, how important do you think local papers and radio stations are to journalism? Well, um, there, it's really interesting. There's some local papers that are thriving. Uh, and it turns out to be smaller communities. And those papers apparently are doing very, very well, um, as opposed to like the Raleigh News and Observer, for instance, which used to be a great paper and isn't. Um, uh, or the Times Picune yeah. in New Orleans, which was yeah. you know, a fabulous paper and now is a website. Um, but, the, uh, but small community papers seem to be doing very, very well. Um, in terms of radio, uh, I don't, I'm not that aware of local radio that much, but I can tell you National Public Radio uh, has you know, more listeners every week. Uh, the NPR news magazines, Morning Edition, All Things Considered, have more listeners. Uh, morning Edition has more listeners than the three network morning TV shows combined. Fantastic. And, uh, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, by a good bit, actually. And wow. um, so uh, the medium is not the problem. The problem is what's on it in some local stations. Fantastic. Yeah. OK, we'll take one more question, please, if there is someone to ask it. Good evening. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Martin Gilbert. I am a student for France. And my, uh, my uh, question is pretty simple. What do you think is the main difference between the press in the United States and the press in Europe? And for instance, uh, my country, France? Well, you're probably a better person to answer that question than I am about France. But um, when I was living in Greece, I certainly saw a lot of the foreign press, as you have, Marvin. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, a lot of foreign press is government controlled. Yes. Um, but um, uh, the, the British press is kind of like the American press of the 18th century. <laughs> they make it up. Uh, <laughs> and, and can I tell a quick story? Do we, what's the time? We're, no, no, we're, we're OK. OK. The, so it was Aristotle and Narcissus' funeral. And um, we're, we're going to uh, his, he's being buried off a little tiny island that he owns. So only the pool goes to the island. Steve was in the pool. I'm back on the slightly bigger island, where the rest of us are all filing from a payphone. And there's a guy who's filing for a British newspaper uh, who's you know, a Greek guy. And he's on the phone. And he says, and the people lined up K-side. And they all <laughs> wept. And I said, Chris, I didn't see anybody crying. And he said, oh, great. That's better. That's better. And none wept because, <laughs> <laughs> because they had no love for this oligarch. You know? <laughs> it was great. Uh, but, but so, um, you know, I, I, I know that there are some wonderful uh, news outlets all around Europe, but there's some pretty funny ones, too. Uh, we are at that time when we're going to wrap up the evening. And I just want to say 
as far as I'm concerned, I had a wonderful time. <laughs> so today. did I. Thank and you. Thank you so it was very, great very to much. Be with you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. And before you all go, before you all go, stay where you are for just one minute because Mike Friedman has an announcement that he'd like to make. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Koki, thank you for a memorable program. We certainly appreciate it. Um, we hope um, that you can join us again two weeks from tonight, Monday, April 15th, at a special start time of 7 p.m., when we will present our next CALB Report program, a conversation with Apollo 11 astronaut Michael Collins on the 50th anniversary of the historic moon landing. Wow. Uh, tickets are now available on our CALB Report website, which is calb.gwu.edu. So we hope to see you then. Again, uh, Koki, thank you so much thank for you. this beautiful program. Thank you, Marvin. Thanks for being with us this evening, folks. Good night. Thank you.